Another hard week in America. There is so much happening. How can we have unity? How can we have unity in Christ? We're going to talk about this. Having good theology will tell us who we are no matter what color your skin is. Number two, how working it out in relationships actually can change the world. Right here on Cooper Stuff. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Cooper Stuff. We are in the middle of another hard week. If, if it feels like that everything is falling apart, just remember this. It's because everything is falling apart, all right? <laughs> We're going through a hard time in this country. We have tons of pain, tons of outrage. Um, I understand the outrage. I understand the protest. But there are people that are angry now. Things have turned violent. We have a little bit of anarchy going on. I think it's fair to say, and I don't think that this is even uh, controversial, that a lot of people would say that that the movement, some of the good of the of what people were protesting for, is being hijacked by some other things. I think that's. I assume that's not going to make people angry with me today. Um, but. It's a pretty strange week to be walking around through it and to go, all right, where do I belong in all this? What is going on? What is the outcome of this? I think in some ways we might have some, we may have some positive things from this in terms of maybe what people always say from conversation, things like that. There's some good stuff that can happen, but I also think there's some bad stuff that can happen. And it, it's, it's very difficult. What I fear is that in the backside of this, that, that race relations are actually going to get worse in some ways. But we can combat that, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What I fear the most, though, is that through all of this, that the church it, it is moving farther away from what I would consider to be orthodox Bible theology. Uh, that the church is going to be taking on philosophies of the world and worldviews that are coming from a place that are actually not really biblical and not helpful. And if we do that, then it will lead us to a place where race relations are actually much worse. And most importantly, within the church, they will be much worse. So there are two podcasts that I really want to do. Number one, I want to do a podcast on what I just said, on what is the orthodox position of, of the Bible in terms of race in terms of, of what the church should believe, in terms of a worldview. What can we do to, you know, combat that on a theological stance? Now, that might be a difficult discussion, and that might be something that a lot of people disagree with, but I feel really passionate about it. The second thing that I want to do is do uh, something on the unity that we have in Christ. A lot of people have asked me, um, you know, the comments on the last few podcasts, John, you talked about what you don't like, why don't you talk about some things you do like, all right? And so I'm like, yeah, I think that would be a really great thing. So I've decided to go about it in this way. I think I could have done either podcast first. I decided that I would do, go in this route. Number one, I want to start today with unity in Christ. What can we do? Because I think that is a more positive message. It is, it is more of a message that I think people can grab a hold of and say, okay, now I, I, I see that I can actually do something. And then we save the other conversation, which I don't think is negative because I like talking about philosophy and theology, but it is going to be a more challenging one and it is going to be a little bit more cutting. Some people might really dislike it is what I'm saying. We'll save that for next week, but I feel really passionate about that conversation. And it's not just because we can't like, we can't give in on theology because, you know, believing the right stuff is all that matters. Well, it's not just, it's not just on the, the basis of principle. Having right theology actually matters in your day-to-day -day life because if you don't have the right principles, if you want to say, uh, it will lead you down a bad path, okay? Right theology teaches us how God wants us to live best. It, that's what's going to be best for us to, in, in, in this world, best for us to know God, but best for us to communicate to our fellow man as well. And if we, if we give in on that theology, then we will move into a territory where we are actually not living our best, okay? So this stuff has me greatly concerned. I went out with my 
my uh, church leader last night, who's one of my best friends, and uh, we were talking about things. I'm like, this is really concerning me. We have to stand up for our faith in this. And and it was really funny. He just reminded me, he's like, you're absolutely right, John. You know, love the passion, John. He said, but you do remember that the church is actually unshakable. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> the church is actually unshakable because the church is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the foundation of God's word. All right. And the church is built upon God's word. And, and so I was like, yeah, we should have hope for that. So in light of that great hope that we have, how can we fight racism in our time? How, how are we supposed to do that? So I don't think that I am the number one best person to do this. My guess is there's a bunch of podcasts out there that are probably going to be a lot better than mine. Don't waste your time with, with me. Um, the difference between mine is that, number one, I've just noticed because I'm distracted by the video that I'm wearing all Star Wars stuff today. Apparently, I've got Star. Um, it's like I'm doing a Star Wars ad. Didn't know that the hat said Star Wars. I just picked it up and put it on. This was given to me from a fan. I love it. Anyway, that's where it's at. I'm not actually getting paid by Disney. Nor do I recognize that Star Wars belongs to Disney. Okay, I said it. There's only three Star Wars films as far as I'm concerned. I said it. <clears throat> and the Clone Wars. That counts. Okay. When we talk about what can we do, we have to start at a, at a few things. We're going to get to it. I believe there's lots that we can do. But I do think that the, the things that really, really make the difference are actually a little bit different than what the world says that we have to do to make the difference. Some of, this is, some of these conversations are going to be generational differences as well. So let's jump into it. First of all, we have to recognize that the, that in the world, as of you know, 20 years ago, the world served an idol of hedonism. That has drastically changed in the last 20 years. Okay, when I say hedonism, what I mean is the world used to worship the god of hedonism, if you will. It is this the philosophy that you just live for pleasure, all right? If you want meaning in life, it's all about pleasure. Do anything you can do to satisfy yourself the most. That has drastically changed. In the world, meaning outside of Christianity, the world now, I think, serves a god of social justice. And so the world has cre has has created this like that the only way to have meaning in life is is to be a social justice warrior, is to fight for justice. And because it has that great word that all Christians love, justice, uh, a lot of us want to jump on board of that. And rightly so. And I think that's really good because we love justice. The problem is, is that social justice defined by the world is actually very different than justice defined by the Bible. Because the world's idea of justice is based on their, their ideas of equality and things like that. The Christian at some point, probably, I hope, will, will end up having a problem with, with what the world calls social justice. Let me give you an example. You, the, the, uh, the social justice of the world may say, hey, every woman deserves in the world deserves to be treated with equality. And the Christian says, yeah, of course. And they say, yeah, therefore, every woman deserves to have equal access to medical care. And the, and the Christian says, oh, that, that sounds good to me. And they say, yeah, therefore, if we're going to have equality, then what we need to do is we need to dump a bunch of Planned Parenthood centers in the middle of downtown, you know, Chicago, in the middle of downtown New York City. And all of a sudden, for what that means for the Christian person, for a lot of Christian people, is they go, oh, are you, you're saying that justice means giving minorities and poor people and in inner city, but more access to abortion care. And they say, yeah, that is what justice is. Well, now all of a sudden you have a problem. I'm not trying to create a controversy with people who disagree with me about pro-life stances. The problem is, is that that is how it keeps going. So the world says, yeah, it is justice to make sure that inner city people have quick and easy care to abortion. Now all of a sudden the Christian says, wow, do I think that justice is making sure we have third trimester abortions? So now we are into another big argument. The world has an idea of social justice that the church might not actually have. So we have to start from a place of realizing that 
For a lot of Christians, you will never be seen as fighting for social justice in the way the world fights for social justice. Because at the, at the time that you say, I don't really know if I want to fight for the abortion clinics, they say, oh, then you don't fight for justice. And so it leaves the Christian with that doesn't really understand the Bible's idea of justice. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying that's the way it is. It leaves us in, in, in a weird place where we're like, I don't know what to do because the world says it's justice and now I'm not doing what's right. I can keep going on and on and on and on. The same with the Women's March. If you want to go to the Women's March to fight for feminism, if you are a part of a group that, that fights for women's rights but doesn't believe in the whole third trimester abortion argument or abortion in general, you will find yourself being ousted from the Women's March. You aren't allowed to be a feminist and pro-life in any kind of a way. Uh, I'm not trying to light a fire here, uh, by the way. I just, said, I just said that this isn't going to be controversial at all. I guess I'm wrong. So a lot. Of, what I'm saying is, is that we as Christians cannot serve an idol of social justice. And that is my first part that I would start. And, and so what I'm trying to say in that is that it doesn't mean we can't stand up in visible ways for causes that we believe uh, are, are good for what we might call like the social gospel, if you will, not feeding the poor, uh, fighting for women's rights, yada, yada. I'm not saying we can't do that, but if what we are looking for is the, the slow clap from the world that you guys are such good people, you probably are not going to get that. At some point, your Christianity will probably collide with the idol of social justice, in my view. It's up to you. Pray about it. So even if you go, John, I think that might be a little bit harsh. Let me say it in another way. If you are to fight for social activism for things that you believe are justice-oriented, your motive cannot be getting the adoration of the world, right? So even if you don't agree with what I said about the social justice thing, I think you will probably agree. What We, we, we do social, uh, our version of social justice, if you want, feeding the poor and the things the Bible commands us to do, looking out for the people that are hurting the most, the least of these, the Bible calls it. We do that to the glory of God. We don't do it to get the glory of man. And if you do it to get the glory of man, then you will not get your treasure in heaven. You, you've gotten your reward here on earth, right? That's what the Bible says. As soon as the world says, oh, you're such a good person, add a boy, pat you on the back, you're such a good person, you have gotten your reward. But the true Christian knows that the reward from the world really doesn't mean anything compared to the reward in heaven. We don't want the reward from the world because we want to glorify God. And guess what? The reward in heaven is so much better than the rewards you get here. The reward in heaven is eternal. The rewards you get here last for the five minutes on social media that everybody, you know, gives, gives you cheers for the virtue signaling. So that feels good for five minutes. God's reward is greater and is eternal. That's what we live for. My starting place is this for the Christian that wants to do something for social change. Check the reason you want to do it. That's for all of us. Check the reason you want to do it. If you're doing it so the world thinks you're a good person, then you've already lost the battle, in my opinion. So now, that is the first thing we have to recognize. You've got to know at some point the world's version of social justice is going to collide with your faith, and you will be forced to make a decision. And if you have gotten used to the attaboys of the world, it feels so good to be woke. It just, it's like a warm bath to be woke it's going to be harder and harder for you to make that stand when it comes, okay? That's the first thing I will, I will want to mention. One thing that I've noticed in generations is this. I want to tell younger people, you have to understand, older generations see action in a different way than younger generations. Younger generations see action in what older generations call virtue signaling. And what that means is that that I, I want to make a change in the world, and the, uh, but what I know I can do is make people aware. So I tweet, and that's it. That is the way I change the world, is by tweeting, Instagramming, Facebook, saying I do something. Older generations, uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say you're wrong for tweeting, because uh, I, I will get to some good examples about that. Um, and, and in fact, maybe I'll give you the good example so you don't think that I'm being mean to you first, Okay. Let me give you an example from my own life, from somebody that I really like, okay, which is my daughter. I like her a ton. So I'm going to give you an example from my daughter so you will see 
that I actually do have grace for a thing. I'm just trying to bring some another view, okay? My daughter feels called to uh, uh, stand um, in, in, in a social media presence kind of a way for a, a pro-life movements. She wants to post about that on Instagram. She wants to talk about it. She wants to bring the awareness. She probably would post something every week. Here's a new fact. You know, babies get lungs at so-and-so months in the womb, so-and-so weeks in the womb, whatever it is, okay? She likes that kind of stuff and feels called to do it. I really like my daughter, and I am proud of her for that she wants to make a stand for something that I believe is godly. <clears throat> I do not feel called to do that on social media for reasons that are actually quite different than hers. I actually don't want to do that for reasons that I go, hey, A, it's not really what I'm called to do. I feel like if I was to do that, it might just be continually making people mad if I am not giving people something they can actively do about it, okay? Some of that is generational. Some of that is just calling because there are things that I will <laughs> I will come on and say, uh, if it's something that I feel called to do, even if it does make people mad. Some of this is an issue of grace. Some of this is an issue of calling to realize that someone has a gift to do something. Not everybody's called to be John the Baptist. Not everybody's called to go out and tell religious people that they're whitewashed tombs, which if you understand the Bible is a huge, huge insult to a religious person. We want to talk about that right now. John the Baptist is one of my favorite Characters, you might have noticed, I can be a little bit like him, all right? Um, so my daughter stands for these things on the abortion issue, and I support her in it. I am, honestly, as a dad, I am proud of her for it. But there's a difference in the generations, okay? Now, I'm also proud of my daughter, which we'll get to later, because not only does she stand for that, she also serves in a local capacity doing free work to help give out literature to people who are thinking about abortion, to pray with people who are thinking about it, or to pray with people who have had an abortion and are feeling an incredible amount of guilt and they feel like God will never like them again. And she's able to pray for them with them on a phone or something of that nature or in person and to, to say, no, 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 that's not how God works. God's forgiveness is free. God's forgiveness comes to anyone who asks for it. You can never do something so bad that God says, no, you're out of the kingdom, all right? You're out of here, and it's so bad that you are too ugly to come to me. Isn't that beautiful? That's an amazing thing about our Lord Jesus Christ. He dies for all of us because we are all just as guilty, just as guilty as anyone else, all right? If you, if you haven't killed someone or you haven't lied or you haven't cheated, you're just as guilty as the murderer, okay? Isn't that awesome that God, it, it, not awesome that we're guilty, awesome that God has mercy for us. So I'm very proud of her for lots of reasons, but we're going to get to that. I just got way off course. I'm saying that story so you will not think that I'm making fun of young people. I am not. There is a generational difference, though, between what a lot of older people say. Say basically all that a lot of young people want to do is post something on social media, but you're not doing anything about it. A younger generation says, no, no, no. Uh, saying something about a thing equals doing something about a thing. I'm not saying that, that that can't be true. I'm saying that that is a generational difference, okay? People uh, I've read in uh, social scientists have, have a name for this. Please don't be offended. I'm just trying to help teach some people some stuff that you don't know. Social scientists call it slacktivism. Slacktivism is where, well, you can imagine, you're mixing activism with being a slacker. In other words, I don't really want to do anything about it, but I do want to post because it's a, it, it takes a lot more work to go and make phone calls to talk to people about pro-life stances than it does to tweet something. That's the idea. And I'm not talk, saying that everybody that posts something is evil and that you're a slacktivist. I'm just giving you the perspective. Some of this is generational, all right? So that is that. Is that. One of the things I would like to combat is the idea then that if you are not posting on social media or if you are not going to a protest then you are not doing anything. And this is this is one of the things that I really want to combat. Now, we will get to some things we can do and, and what I think. But if what you're saying is, is the only thing that means something is you vocally standing up on social media, I think that that, that is a, a big part, part of the problem here. That, to me, is the, the problem with silence is violence. If you're not saying it on social media, you don't believe a thing. 
And I think that that's problematic for lots and lots and lots of reasons. And I think that it's also, how do you want to say this? That is a result of a lot of what I believe is a real negative aspect of social media. Because social media is is kind of like, in social media, you're not really showing your true self to the world. You are picking and choosing all the best stuff that you think about yourself to show people about who you are. You're not showing people the the pictures of you waking up in the morning looking like, uh, you know, utter dog poo. You're not doing that. You're showing pictures of yourself when you look the best you could possibly look. So there's this idea of the only things I show the world is the very best parts of me. So in a sense, social media is not actually reality. Social media it's kind of like the matrix, you know, social media is like, this is the world I show people. It doesn't have anything to do with, with my heart. So what we get into is, is an issue of that. There are people that are doing quite a lot to bring unity in Christ, but they just don't show it on social media. And if we believe that, that social media is all that matters, then what it looks like is like you are doing something, but it doesn't count. And I don't think that that's a really good thing. So I have, I think we have to decide, you know, decide, are we, are we, are we going to think that social media changes the world or is it our lifestyles that change the world? Maybe it's a bit of a mixture. So I will give grace to people who say, I believe that it's my calling. For instance, with racism, I want to say every three days, I want to post a new disparity that happens between whites and blacks. I want to post another bad police video, another terrible thing that a white person did to a black person. All these things are real. Uh, And uh, in other words, the disparities are real. There is racism that happens. There are some people that really want to post those things on a week by week basis and they feel called to do it. I have grace for those people. But what I want to say is that it could be the case that people like myself, I kind of think that that just adds fuel to a fire and it doesn't actually give us an answer beyond the awareness that all this stuff exists, all right? So the question comes then, how can we have unity in Christ? I think we have unity in Christ and we can make a real difference in this fight for racism in two ways. Number one, understanding good Bible theology about what it means to be in the kingdom of God because it is so absolutely unifying and it is so absolutely beautiful. It is so much better then what the world is offering, what the world is offering is actually not unity. What the world is offering is actually breaking us up into different groups that need to see each other based on our skin color or based on our uh, wealth, you know, based on our class, if you will, based on the kind of music that we like. That is the reason that, that everybody goes into cliques and, you know, this sort of thing. And so good theology, number one, And number two, I would say implementing that good theology into everyday relationships. I believe the world has changed through relationships, and I believe there's good theology to to teach us that. So let's start with the first part first. Good theology. What does the Bible have to say about good orthodox theology about race? Here we go. Number one, a lot of Christians... A lot of people would be like, John, I know all this. Why are you saying it? But some people don't, or maybe you've forgotten. But I want to bring us back to something that is so cool and so beautiful. This is why theology matters. Good Orthodox theology teaches us this, that every single human being on this planet, on every single human being, no matter what color you are, no matter where you come from, we have one father. And I'm not talking about God the Father. I'm talking about one earthly father. And that is Adam. Every single one of us comes from Adam. Now, that is good orthodox theology, and it matters in lots and lots of ways. For one thing, it matters because if we all came from Adam, then that is how original sin is is passed down. In other words, if there are people that are on this world living that weren't created by Adam, then you might not be tainted by original sin, which means that if you haven't ever sinned, It changes the whole idea of the concept of Jesus. Do we? Do we? Do you even need redemption through Christ? Because if you were touched by original sin, then you still have the ability to be born with original righteousness. For instance, that is not good theology. Good theology tells us that we all come from Adam, and what that means is that wait for it. It's just so amazing. We are actually one race. We are the human race, 
and we all come from Adam. So yes, we have different skin color, we have different shades of melanin, which is an awesome, beautiful thing that I don't think should be discounted. In my view, it makes the body of Christ more beautiful. It's awesome to see all these different shades of melanin. That's a really beautiful thing, okay? <clears throat> and of course, we know why that is. Some people live closer to the equator. I don't know if you've ever noticed that people that are from Iceland are not as dark as people that are from Africa, okay? But we all come from one, one human father, that is Adam. So we actually are the same in terms of that. We come from different cultures. So the Bible calls it ethnicity is a better word than race for this. We, we all come from different ethnicity, different tribes, you might say, different cultures. And yes, our skin looks different, but we have one father, which is so beautiful and so unifying. Well, the more amazing thing than that, that is even just so unbelievable, I shared a couple weeks ago, is that if you are in Christ, then not only do we have one earthly father, we have one God, was one heavenly father, and he has supernaturally made us into one people. He's done something supernatural that we can't actually do without God. Do you know what I mean? In the world, you can have a friendship with someone that's different color skin than you, and you can be like, dude, we're family, we're one, and that's really cool, but you are not joined together supernaturally into covenant. Do you understand? You are not in a covenant relationship. You might even make a promise to each other, but it is not a heavenly covenant. God has joined people of all different races together in a heavenly covenant that cannot be broken. You understand that? So there are people in Africa that I've never met, people in Asia that I've never met, will never meet. We probably don't look the same. We probably don't like the same kind of music. Some of these people don't like skillet. That might be sin. That's up to God. We're going to, some of the people that might not, not like Star Wars, or even worse, some of those people might like episodes one through three, which is really tragic, not Star Wars. We're going to be different people, but God has joined us together supernaturally in a way that man can't do without God because it is an eternal covenant. It will go on for all eternity, cannot be broken. The Bible says it like that, like this. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no slave, there is no free, there is no rich, there is no poor. You know what that means? It means there is no black, there is no white. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So when we see each other, we are not meant to see each other based on distinctions between all the things that where we come from, an immutable characteristic uh, of, of skin color or something like that, or the kind of music that we like. We're not to make distinctions between ourselves and the kingdom of God because we are all one. The theology of the Bible on race is so beautiful and so unifying that if we were to believe it, I believe it would change us from the inside out. And that is what we need. We need to be changed from the inside out. So if you were to ask me, where, John, how are we supposed to fight against racism in this world that we live in? I would say that my idea of fighting racism is quite different than the, the, the worldly social justice version, okay? My idea to fight racism, racism is not to see each other with all these incredible distinctions. My idea is to go, no, we're actually the same. Now, let me say this real fast because some people are going to be a little offended at what I just said. I want to make an acknowledgement <clears throat> that in the, the new worldly ideology that is coming out, uh, which is... I don't even know what to call it. It's the it's the philosophy of, oh gosh, what do you want to call this? Uh, that we are born into a a systemic white racism. You know, the, the white supremacy created a system of racism that we all are a part of. That ideology, you know, the kind of the, the woke ideology, I don't know what you want to call it. Whatever all that philosophy is, I need to say this. That teaches me that as a white person, that if I believe that when I see people that I quote, don't see people in color, which was kind of the Martin Luther King version of a society, you know, like a colorblind society, meaning, hey, we don't see each other based on the color of our skin. We see each other as fellow human beings, all made in the image of God. That philosophy is now being called, what they would call privilege. What they mean by that is saying, yeah, you don't see people in color because you're white. You have the privilege of not seeing a color because you haven't been under the, uh, the oppression of a, of a society that systemically oppresses black people. So I will say this. 
I do understand. I do understand what they mean. They're saying that you have the luxury of not seeing color, but we can't help seeing color because we are abused by the police more than whites. We are looked at passed over for for jobs more than whites. We're pulled over more than whites. We are looked at differently in stores more than whites. I do understand all those things. It doesn't mean that I don't have empathy for uh, for the idea, and I don't want to be so. Uh, what's the word? Uh, what's the word? I don't want to be so like heartless or, or, or unsympathetic might be a good word. I don't want to be unsympathetic to, 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 to the fact that I, I know those disparities exist. And I recognize it's different for black people than it is for white people. But at the same time, when I look at my theology, what God is saying is, is that, yeah, no matter what you've been through, I actually have made you one. So... It's a little bit like, am I going to, 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 am I going to believe what the world is telling me because I want to be a nice person and sympathize? Or am I going to believe what God is telling me? Yeah, I know those things exist, but I have done something new and supernatural that supersedes a worldly outlook on life. Does that make sense? It's not that I'm not unsympathetic, but we have to realize that even in the Bible, there was a lot of racism going on. We know this. So when, when, when Paul says there is no Jew and no Gentile, what he means is there's a lot of racism going on here. There is a lot of othering, if you want to call it. That's the new word for today, othering going on here. Jews did not see Gentiles in the same way. In fact, a lot of the Jewish Christians believe that if Gentiles wanted to be saved, they had to come through Jewish traditions. In other words, yeah, you guys are from outside of the Old Covenant. You need to be brought in through Judaism because we are othering you and you are not as good as us. So Paul talks a whole lot about that. Paul didn't say, hey, guys, you, you know, Jewish Jewish people, you, know, you got to understand your privilege and you have to see Gentiles as different than you because they have a different story. You got to be sympathetic. He, that's not what Paul said. He spent a lot of time going back to the Jews saying, you need to understand, there is no difference. You are not better than they are. There is no difference. You are one. So good Bible theology says, yes, we love people. We understand the plight. But the answer is not in seeing yourself as different from the Gentiles. The answer is seeing yourself the same as the Gentiles. That is a huge argument that some people are probably not going to like. But if you want to ask me what I think we can do, this is the key. The key is that we realize that we are one. So how does that actually work out? Let me give you some examples in my real life. And this goes into, what do we do about it? What do we do about racism? How do we fight it? I want to give you an example. After Ferguson a few years ago, which tore America up, um, I was really struggling. Uh, I was really struggling because I hate racism. I come from a city, as I told you, Memphis, Tennessee, where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. I grew up in a... a a difficult town of racism, okay? I wanted to join in the fight for Ferguson and I didn't know how. And so I called my, uh, sorry, I didn't call, I did a gig with one of my people that I love the most, you might know, Mr. Topbox, Byron. He's black. And I, and I was hanging out with Byron. I said, hey, Byron, we've been friends for several years, but we've actually never really talked about like, the race stuff because it's just never been an issue. We're really good friends. One of my favorite people. We are brothers, by the way. All right. Family. And I just said, I need to have a talk with you, Byron. And I want to be as honest with you as I can. And I need you to be as honest with me as you can be. You won't offend me. I just said it straight up. I said, Byron, this stuff is going on in Ferguson and I don't know what to do. Do you think that if I don't join a protest, and if I don't join Black Lives Matter, do you think that I am being a racist? Do you think that I am not, you know, serving in the kingdom of God in the way I should be serving? And we had this really long talk about it. And Byron, you know what Byron said to me? I asked him if I could tell these conversations. And then he's, in the end, he said, John, you know what the answer for all of this stuff is? It's the word of God. The word of God is what can change hearts. And it's about relationship. The word of God changes changes me to forgive people who didn't ask forgiveness and the word of God changes people like you that haven't seen black people as being one, one in Christ. That's basically what he said. I just thought it was the most beautiful conversation. So we began to have a conversation and it was then that I was convinced 
that black people are, are pulled over by the police and treated worse than white people. I, I'm admitting this thing because what I'm trying to tell you is I didn't start believing that a few years ago because white people were yelling at me on social media. I didn't believe it a few years ago because people kept telling me that I'm a racist. I didn't believe it a few years ago because people kept telling me how good my life has been. I believed it because I actually asked a black friend of mine. <laughs> it might really sound stupid, but I trust Byron. He's like, yeah, I get pulled over. My family gets pulled over. You're just looked at different. You just can feel it. And I was like, wow, I believe you. Relationship is where change actually happens. And for all of the, the people in the world and, and even in the church that say, no, no, change only happens by doing a big, huge vocal thing on social media. I have to outwardly stand for something. If you think that that's how change happens and it doesn't happen through relationship, now we have some very big disagreements. I'm not saying it can't happen in the big way, but I'm saying if you're saying it can't happen through relationships, that I go, I don't really know because what I see Jesus doing, yes, Jesus had a public ministry where he preached. He was the son of God. It's a whole different thing. Uh, but Jesus spent his time with 12 guys. And to the degree, have you thought about the fact that this? We know that Jesus knew how to, to read and write, right? <laughs> Sounds really stupid. We know that Jesus knew how to write. But Jesus did not write his own words down. I've often wondered, why didn't Jesus just write, <laughs> write down his thoughts? Jesus poured in, in discipleship to 12 men. He taught them his words. And that's what he says. He says, I want you to go to all the world and preach my words. You already know my words because I've given them to you. And you already know that they were from God because I didn't say anything that the Father didn't tell me to say. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So everything I said was from the Father. I gave you my words. Now you go and tell them the, my words. That is what reproduction is. You are reproducing yourself into other people. We see that in, uh, in, in, in the New Testament, whether it is Paul or some of the apostles that are writing to the church. They're, they're teaching the church to love one another. They're not teaching the church to go into the government of Rome or to the worldly governments and yell and scream about the things that the worldly governments need to change in order to bring love. What he taught them was you need to love each other. You need to realize that you are one. And in that relationship, you will actually learn what it means to love people and love each other. And the church will become so glorious and so wonderful and so beautiful and so amazing that the world will see the way you love each other and they will want to be joined to the church through Christ Jesus. So that is about evangelism, but that is also about the church being the true light of the world, like a city on a hill. The church, in that sense, is more like a government. Do you, I don't mean a worldly government. I mean the government of God, the kingdom of God, that is, you know, the kingdom of God is an invisible you know, realm, an invisible kingdom, but it is coming to the hearts of men. And the more we unify, the more the kingdom of God is going to the world. Am I saying that you can't go to the government and change law? No, I'm not saying that. But what we didn't see is Paul encouraging Christians saying, I know that some of you are being beaten for your faith. I know that some of you are being killed for your, for your faith. So what you need to do is go to the government of Rome and petition for them to love in the way that we love. That's not what he was saying. What he said was, I know that some of you are being beaten for your faith, but you can't stop preaching the gospel. The world will know you for the way you love each other. So I guess what I would say is, I actually believe if you want to do something amazing for against racism and the kingdom of God, it's about relationship. Now, the world says, oh, yeah, it is. It's about listening. It's about hearing. But the world's version of that social justice still entails a lot of strange things. I will give you an example. One of the strange things that I believe is strange, we're beginning to see it in the church, too. If you're into it, please don't be mad at me. It's the way I see scripture. That is saying, no, no, you do need to have relationships, but you need to recognize that in that relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, the, the, the white person still is coming from a place of privilege. And so you need to listen. And I know, that, for instance, there are groups going on where people meet together to talk about what can we do to fight for each other. But in that, the white people aren't actually allowed to talk. All you're allowed to do is listen. 
Again, I'm sympathetic to the idea. The idea is that these people haven't had a voice for a really long time. So instead of you, your voice, give up your pride and just listen to other people. I'm not against that in principle. But once you start having relationship and in relationship, you kind of just can't act like a normal person. And you are always viewing it through a place of, I need repentance for my forefathers. Then I don't think you're actually having a relationship. What if you did that in your relationship with, with your spouse, right? Like something that you've done, that, something that you are, maybe have, have, have sinned against your spouse in some way, and, and you will never get rid of it. I'm not even talking about a spouse who won't forgive, you know, the, the, their husband for something he did 20 years ago. What I'm saying is, is that, no, this is something your spouse has done to you and will always do with you against you and can never get out of just for the fact that he is a certain way. Well, now you always have this rift in between you that you, you can't actually be yourself. You, you, you're always coming from a position of, I know I need repentance. I know I need repentance. And I'm just going to defer to you constantly. In my view, that's not actually relationship. Let me give you another example from one of my black friends I was speaking to who grew up in a really, really hard life that I can't even understand. I'm talking about ghetto Southside Chicago. And the unbelievable things that he has seen from police abuse. Police, uh, I, I believe one of his family members was killed by the police. Uh, police, he said, body slamming old women. I, I've heard all these like insane stories. I won't even get into them. I believe the stories because he's my friend. I believe him, all right? He has this unbelievable, terrible thing, history. And we were talking and he told me something that I've never known. And it's the fact that he said, I, gotta, I just got to tell you, he said, I grew up racist against white people. I never knew any white people. I just said, they're the reason my life sucks, frankly. They're the reason my life is bad. They have done this to me, and I was racist against white people. Now, I didn't tell him that in the new woke ideology, it's impossible for a black person to be racist against a white person, of course, which is a whole other thing. So if you think that I'm being offensive by saying it, these are his words, okay? He said, I was just racist, didn't like white people. He said it was years and years before I met any white people. And then I began to have a white friend, somebody that I was like, wow, well, he's different. And he became the exception to the fact that white people were bad. Does this sound familiar? I grew up with a lot of white people like this. A lot of white people that saw black people not as the same, not as one, as a group of people that they really didn't like. But little by little, they met a black person that they liked. They're like, well, uh, he's, he's one of the good ones, right? I know that's hyper offensive. I'm saying I grew up in a, in a city like that, Memphis. He's saying the same thing that I heard a lot of white people say. And as he was talking about, he came to Christ, my friend, my black friend. He said, yeah, I came to Christ. And when I came to Christ, I began to meet more white people. And I began to realize the, the stuff in my heart that made me think that white people were actually all bad. And I realized that I can't hold these white people responsible for all the things that have happened in my life. Even if their ancestors did it to mine, it's not them. I realize that I actually am one with these people and I love them and I don't even notice the skin color anymore. That is what the Holy Spirit does. That is, that is Holy Spirit power. That's something that I don't know. I, I got to tell you what I believe. I don't think that that is possible outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the regenerating work of God. You repent for your sins. He gives you a brand new heart that is capable of love and forgiveness. And then the Holy Spirit begins to do a work in your heart. And all of a sudden, he finds himself forgiving people who haven't even asked for his forgiveness. Hello. Do you hear that? I'm going to say it again. He finds himself forgiving people who haven't actually asked for his forgiveness. We're not even getting into the conversation of should they have asked for his forgiveness because it's kind of moot. The point is is that the Spirit of God will do a work in somebody's heart. Here's how Jesus said it. Martin Luther King basically quoted Jesus saying it. The world tells you to love people who love you. That's easy. The heathens do it. The pagans do that. You don't have to be saved to love people that love you. But I tell you, you need to pray for your enemies. Woo! That's the Bible. Don't just love the people that love you. I want you to love people that don't love you back. In fact, love people that hate you. That is what true forgiveness does. That is what the power of the Holy Spirit does. 
One of my other friends in church that goes to my church about a month ago, you have to understand that we live very close to Chicago. I'm in Wisconsin. Chicago had a lot of COVID-19 restrictions that Wisconsin didn't have. So we had an influx of people from Chicago coming up to, to our area, but, you know, frankly, because they wanted to actually like, you know, live a life. So all of a sudden we had a lot of gang stuff, a lot of gang violence happened in our city that has not really ever happened before from that. All right. One of my friends, he's white. One of my friends had a stray bullet come into his house, right? And you know what that sort of thing can do for some people? Please nobody be offended. What it can do for some white people is that all of a sudden they go, you know what? Black gang violence did that and therefore every black person is in a gang. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is a racist thought, all right? That isn't some weird version of racism from the world. That is an actual racist thought. A black person did something bad to me Therefore, all black people are like that. And you know what my friend, you know what my friend is like? He's like, uh, it was a random bullet. It was a gang violence. I, I understand why people are angry and it happens, but that's not what black people are like because I am one with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Forgiving people who would never ask for forgiveness. In other words, the skin color doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just bad people doing bad stuff. And it is the Holy Spirit that does a regenerating work that says, yeah, a bullet came into my house, could have killed my wife. Hello, could have killed me. But you know what? The Holy Spirit can do an amazing work. It's all about the gospel. Those people need Jesus. What are you going to say? That is the regenerating work of Christ. You think that doesn't change people? He didn't go on Twitter and yell about it. He just did the actual work of forgiving people. Man, I think that's awesome. I was talking to another friend in my church last week. He's not black. He's actually Hispanic. But the same principle goes. I was talking to him about it. And he was saying, you know what, for me, he said, I went into the Marines. I wasn't a Christian. I went into the Marines. And he said, I thought I'd always been told, he said, that when you go into the armed forces, that there is this camaraderie that happens that now all of us, number one identity, no matter where you come from, is in that we are all Marines. We are all fighting for something. It unifies us. And he said, that actually is true but after a few months, you actually find out that even though that's true, everybody starts being racist against brown people, against black people, against whatever people that aren't white. He said that it just starts to happen. And they're not jokes. They actually say, hey, we're totally one. We're in the brotherhood, but you are different than me. And he said, it really made me mad for several years. Then I became a Christian. And then all of a sudden I started finding something happen in my heart that just said, you know what? I don't know what these guys have been through. I don't really know where they come through. In the end, I know that I am one with them for our brotherhood in the Marines, and I'm one with them as an American. And God has done something in my heart that I just don't have time to be mad about it anymore. I got so excited because I said, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the power of the gospel. So if we are to believe that this only happens through some big thing, I think that you're missing the power of relationship. And I want to encourage Christians to have relationship with other kinds of people. And if you, and if one of your friends, here's what I would say, I have some black friends. Well, out of my black friends, there are not many, like many that have been this way, but some are, are kind of like, John, I don't want to talk about this racism stuff. It's on you to figure it out. That, that exists. Um, and that is something you're hear, hearing in the world a little bit, but all of my other black friends are just like, dude, Absolutely not. We're one in Jesus. We, let's talk about it. Let's see why we're different. <clears throat> but even to a black friend of mine that would just say, you don't get it, John, and I'm dumb or, or I, I'm upset with you. I don't argue with them. I, in that case, I listen to what they have to say. I pray on what they have to say. I don't come back and say, you're not believing the Bible. I just go, okay. I might ask them if they thought about some things. But in the end, I don't see it as my job to convince them to think like me. I see it as my job to continually think of them, not as a black Christian, but as a brother in Christ, that we are actually one supernaturally in covenant. So the last thing that I want to say for the kind of Christians is, John, I hear you. I do believe that it, its relationship is really good. I do believe in the theology of it. But John, I still have to say, I still got to believe that we can do something big that the world sees because 
The world is all about doing something on a huge level and we are not vocal in the way that we should be. <clears throat> I guess what I would say to you is this. I hear you and I love it. I don't know if I have a great answer for that, but I actually believe, here's what I believe, whether it's big and vocal or whether it's in secret, I will leave it to you. There are amazing things that you can do to stop racism. They just cost you your time. They cost you your money. They cost you spending time listening to people. And honestly, they, they cost you agape love. That's just the way to say it. A big brother thing. In other words, a lot of what's happening is you can call it systemic racism if you want to. You can call it systemic poverty if you want to. You can call it systemic racism it has an incredible effect of poverty. I don't know what you want to call it. But what I do know is that there are a lot of extremely poor people that really need love. They really need food. They really need education. They really need someone to listen to them, okay? I, they need somebody that if their single parent gets arrested in the middle of the night and they don't have anybody to call, that they can call you. I mean, that's real stuff. It's going to cost you something. It costs you waking up in the middle of the night. It costs you going, going down to the police station. Whatever it does, it's hard work. But there are a ton of amazing big brother programs, big sister programs, where you get with somebody. It is agape love. Agape love meaning that you don't do it in order to get something back other than relationship, but it costs you your time. You don't get the glory for it. You just do the actual work. Isn't that, you, you know what I'm saying? There are amazing programs you can give money to. If you say, John, I'm, I just don't really have money to give to food programs and programs that, that, that help tutor kids after schools. These, these places exist in nearly every city. Every city will have some church doing some organizational work. If you don't have the money, you can go down and serve soup. That's a real thing. Or you go down on a Saturday morning. Here's something that my church did. My church found an inroad with a principal at the poorest, most difficult school in the city. Amazing devastation. I won't even tell you all of the devastation. And my church got an inroad with the principal. And we began after school programs that were tutoring and Saturday morning workshops. My brother-in-law actually started it for my church. Saturday morning workshops that was free, didn't cost anybody a penny. My church paid for all of it. And every single Saturday, 40 to 60, mostly white adults or teenagers, went down to, to, to do this Saturday morning workshop, free to anyone in the neighborhood or from the school that wanted to come. We fed them breakfast, and then we would have several hours of hanging out. That included teaching people to read, teaching people to write. A lot of Spanish-speaking kids that, frankly, don't know English. They, they, so we have white, uh, white Christians that are teaching Spanish kids to speak English, okay? That's the whole thing. Going down to do the work, teaching kids how to throw a football, how to run patterns, how to climb a pole, teaching them about loyalty, teaching them about work ethic, teaching them math. I mean, this is real stuff. Now, we didn't do it on Facebook. We didn't do a, any sort of hashtag about all the great things we were doing. We just went to do the work. Every city has programs like this. If you don't have the money, you've got the time. That's what I believe. That's what I want to spend my time and my money doing is saying, whether we all agree on whether this is systemic racism and pop, whether we have all the right buzzwords and whether we have all the right, we need to listen, whatever it is, I know that I can do the actual work of changing people's lives. And that's not just black lives, that's brown lives if you want to call it. It is pe and and there are white suffering people in those economic situations. We, you are helping the poor, you're helping the least of these in a real way that is not about screaming. We're not asking the government for anything. We are spending our money and my time to help someone with something that frankly they can't give us anything back. It's not reciprocity beyond the joy of relationship, which I would say is real. To me, that is Christian. To me, that is what Jesus did. To me, that's what Jesus said about the person, you know, the Good Samaritan story. That's what Jesus said about the Good Samaritan. Everybody's walking by and doesn't want to help the person that got beat up in the ditch. And as my one of my teachers at my church, Scott, said last week, Jesus is telling this parable and everybody's passing the guy by and the Samaritan comes along and actually just helps 
I think my, 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 my teacher, Scott, said something to the effect of, he didn't make a sign and put it in there and say, stop hurting people and make a whole big government movement. He just helped the person. To me, that is what true Christianity is. So I got a word for you here. If this is a word from God for you, you take it. If it's not a word from God, you ignore it or you pray on it, whatever you want. I believe that God might be saying something to us right now that is this. Two options. You might have to do the hard work of helping the least of these. Okay? I'm talking about the hard work, time, money, effort, no kind of sort of like reciprocity, if you want to call it that. Nothing in it for me. Hard work of the gospel that will have actual lasting results. But you will get no virtue points from the world. The world is not going to pat you on the back. They are not going to say, good job. They are not going to say, you're so woke. They're not going to do it. You won't get the virtue of the world. In fact, you can do the real work, have the results, not get virtue points, and still be accused of not joining in the fight against racism. The other option is you don't do the hard work. You don't put in the time. You don't put in the money. You don't put in the effort, but you post a bunch of stuff on social media. It doesn't have the results, but you get the virtue points. Hello. Is that something God might be saying to us? I don't know. I think that's something he's saying to me. I think what God is saying to me is, why don't, John, why don't you do the hard work of helping fight racism and expect no virtue points because you will have a reward in heaven? rather than trying to man please, rather than trying to get your treasure from the world. Woo, that's what the gospel says. Final thing I'll say for anybody that says, yeah, John, but can't we marry both things? You know what I would say to you? I would say, sure. I'm not saying I know how to do that. Maybe that's a part of, when I said, remember I talked about the generational divide and the way that we see activism? Maybe there's a generational divide that you can be a part, a, a part of helping. All that I would encourage you, the, the, you Christians that that I'm that I'm proud of that want to do the activism, like my daughter, I'm proud of her, I'm proud of you, believe me when I say it. Part of what I would tell my daughter, who already knows this, and some of you is, is this. Don't be haughty. Don't view yourself because you want to do it in a public way. Don't view yourself as caring more about the activism than someone who is actually doing the work but doesn't understand the social media aspect. Don't be arrogant in that way, I would say that. And just think of ways, God, how can I join the two things? In other words, for my church that does work at uh, the, the, the school helping the poor on Saturday mornings, maybe we could do a better job of posting it online, but we're not posting all the terrible things. We are posting the victories. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're not posting... Another thing about a, what a white person beat a black person up or a white cop did this. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with posting those things, but we are highlighting the victories. We are highlighting the relationships. You want to know the best thing I saw online? The number one best thing that I saw that I thought, that is what the world needs to see. If you guys see this viral thing about this white guy and this black guy that had this huge sign in their neighborhood that said black or white, uh, I can't remember what it black or white, join a uh, conversation with a beer, um, uh, hanging out with a beer. Gosh, I can't remember what it said. I wish I could remember it right now, but I saw it on the news and I died laughing because they literally said in their neighborhood, come join us for conversation and a beer. And, and the picture is a white guy with a huge beer cooler and a black guy and they're all hanging out and they interview the white guy and the black guy. And they're like, we've been best friends for years. This is family. My kids... He's a dad to my kids, and the, the black guy's a, a dad to my kids. We just, we're best friends, and we want to tell people, hey, let's hang out and have some fun. I I thought it was so funny. I wanted to repost it, but, you know, it has the beer aspect, and a lot of Christians would make, get mad about that. I'm not encouraging you to go drink a case of beer, but the sentiment of what they were doing, I was like, well, that seems pretty cool to me. They were posting something that is positive, that is real, that's about relationship, that shows us that, yeah, we come from two different neighborhoods and we got totally different stories. I don't under, always understand what he is going through, but I know that we are one. So look, I know that maybe this conversation isn't exactly what some people want to hear. I, hope, I Honest to God, hope that I don't offend people. I hope I cause some people to think and to realize that God is doing something really powerful in the world. I just don't want to see the church verge away from what the Bible really says about race. If the church becomes a place 
where blacks and whites get together and we no longer have real relationship because we see each other as a black Christian or a white Christian, I think at that point that we are ripping away the true identity that we have in Christ. I hope that gives you some positive reinforcement, some great conversation. Send me a comment. Hey, if you think it's something good to do, even if you disagree, put it up on the comments saying we will pray about it. Thank you so much for watching Cooper Stuff. Cooper Stuff!